It's not a Sunday and there is another Miro's video. We are starting to see each other on weekdays. This is turning into a very serious relationship. Therefore, subscribe! Hello and welcome to this month's installment of Hoa Conundrums, an accidental series on this channel, but here it is and that's where we are. Today I will answer to five of your questions, which is a bit less than usual, but we will go more in depth today and the questions are more complex, but don't worry, we will not go way too deep in this channel. At least not today, maybe sometime in the future, you know, you will need to bring your handkerchief, but that's not the kind of video that this is today. So before this intro gets any longer, let's start off with the first question. Could you please talk more about watering? You mentioned using rainwater, what is your rain collection method, especially in winter? Is it a pain? My plants spent last summer outside and I saw firsthand how they loved the rain. Now they are not definitely as happy indoors and although there are many factors, I'm wondering whether my tap water is one culprit. And then information is pH 9.5, TDS 120 ppm. How did you decide to collect rainwater versus adjusting pH? First of all, could I talk more about watering? Um, yeah, I could talk about watering forever. I would love it. I'm not sure that that is true for the rest of the people watching this channel. Second, you mentioned using rainwater. Yes, I predominantly use rainwater to water all of my plants. Sometimes I will use the water from my dehumidifier because I do use dehumidifier, especially in winter daily, and all that water collects. Now, because I recently got a grow tent, I am using the water from dehumidifier for the humidifier in the grow tent. It's just a magical cycle in here and I am now going to use more rainwater to water my plants. What is my rain collection method? And especially in winter, is it a pain? Yes, it is a pain and oftentimes I will get wet. And uh, there are several problems with my rain collection method. First of all, it's a very, I'm gonna say ephemeral collection water method. Method that I use relies on my neighbor's house that is potentially close to 200 years old and is about to get torn down because someone else bought it. No one lived in this house for 30 years or close to 30 years. So what happened is that one of their gutters became detached and it is detached just enough so it doesn't make a mess. The water from that gutter goes into the garden that we have and I just put a bucket there and you know, the water went straight into my bucket. I used many, many different buckets and uh, you know, just recently I put a 40 liter barrel there but the problem with that is that the water will get spoiled over time because it's not really protected. It's not under a shade or anything. So in summer, when it gets very hot, this water can get spoiled if you don't empty this 40 liter barrel. It's a plastic barrel. Now the bucket thing, I used to use buckets and I still do use buckets, is that you have to empty them pretty quickly. When you have a lot of rain, they will start to overflow. So you have to go out in the rain and exchange the bucket for a different one. It gets a bit, um, it's, it's a task, I'm not gonna lie, it's a task. And then I cannot have all these buckets laying around in the yard. So what I do is I refill plastic bottles. The summer of 2021 was very dry, there was no rain, and that's the issue with rainwater, when it's very dry, when there is no rain, you ain't gonna have water. So I had to purchase distilled water, quite a lot of it, in fact, and the good side of it is, you know, I have these five liter bottles that now I use to put my rainwater in so I don't have to go out and buy buckets. In winter, I will try to fill as many plastic bottles that I have that anyone I know has. I will refill them and I will store them in this storage space. It's kind of like a kitchen in summer, but in winter it's really a storage space and I will keep my rainwater there. I have probably around 100 liters of rainwater and you know, if it doesn't rain in winter, which sometimes it doesn't, then I have that water to rely upon and you know, 
Plants don't need as much water in winter, thank goodness. Plus I have my dehumidifier to help me out because that gets maybe three liters every two to three days. I can get three liters out of that, so I will also store that in a bucket or whatever vessel that I can find. The issue with collecting rainwater for me is, first of all, my system isn't very efficient. Another issue, at least in, in this area, is that sometimes there will be sand in the rain because of the... I don't know, as someone said, it's uh, the Sahara Desert sand. I don't know, I I'm not knowledgeable, at, at least not that much. So even though this is a very small town where I live in, it's not a big city, the air isn't polluted, it's a good quality air, sometimes you will have things like that that will be in your rainwater and sometimes you know just dirt in the gutter will also be in the barrel and you know over time if you let it it will sit on the bottom but when you're trying to get the water out with a pitcher you will disturb some of it sometimes you can get leaves and stuff but that's not a big issue for me really the biggest issue is constantly refilling and moving this water and also in winter i have to bring it inside in the house next to a radiator at least 24 hours before i want to water sometimes i actually heat up the water on the stove not a lot of course or uh, it depends really because I have a 10 liter watering tank, uh, the pump sprayer. I will heat five liters of that of the water and then I will add five liters of the water that is not heated up. Obviously, I can talk a lot about water and watering. I would like to switch to RO water. I think it would be much simpler for me and now because I have to refill my humidifier, I will need something that is similar to distilled water. My tap water, unfortunately, is not very good for watering plants. PPM is very high. It is around 400. So that is a lot. And I think most of that is calcium. Uh, I can see calcium deposits when I wash something. So I would really enjoy if I had RO water. I just have to find the space for all the filters that you need under the sink because currently there isn't any. Now, the pH of my tap water, I do believe, is around 8.5. In this question, the pH is 9.5, and that's quite a high pH or um, a very alkaline pH. For plants, you will need something that is closer to acidic or neutral. When I am watering plants in semi-hydro, I usually go for pH of around 6. Now, I don't do this for organic substrates if there is a lot of bark or moss, because bark and moss will degrade over time, and that will affect the pH. It will become more acidic over time, the potting medium, and you know, you don't really need to pH adjust if your water is around seven. A rainwater that I collect, it seems to me, when I measure it, it's around 6.5 to seven. So if I'm not going to water something in semi-hydro, I will not adjust it, I will leave it as is. I will just add some fertilizer and the ppm is around 30 so that's a good ppm now this ppm in this question around 120 i would definitely use that water some bottled water has ppm of 120 i i think that's great ppm i would definitely use that i would just ph down from 9.5 to something that is around 7. in hydroponic stores you can find solutions. I think there are like some types of acid that you can use to pH down your water. And I do use that uh, when I want to water in semi-hydro because LECA will raise the pH a bit. So you want to lower it. So, you know, in the end, it's around 6.5 to 7. And I just want to say you are not wrong that quality of water can affect how your plants will grow if your water has a lot of dissolved solids in it it may affect your plants it depends what those dissolved solids are and you know some tap water is better than other tap water in one country will vary from city to city it can also vary within one city so it depends. The TDS meters are very inexpensive. You can get one, you can check what your PPM is. I would really go for 30 to 50 perhaps for starting PPM and then add fertilizer for that. I would even go for 100. I don't think that would be a big issue. When I'm done adding fertilizer, usually my water will be around 350 to 400 PPM. So, you know, if you start with 400 and then you add fertilizer to that, well, it's 
pretty obvious how it's easy to burn the roots or burn the leaves or whatnot. Now, pH is also very important because it can affect how your plant absorbs the nutrients. I don't think I talked about that as much on this channel, but there is a certain pH range for certain nutrients and micronutrients, and uh, within that pH range, they can be absorbed. If your pH is too low or too high, you can end up locking out those nutrients. Plants will not be able to absorb them if the pH is too low or too high, basically. There is a chart, I, if I find it, I will attach it in this video that is available online. If you Google, I think maybe perhaps pH fertilizer chart or something like that, then you will see how it looks like. Anyways, to finish up this question, water is indeed very important. It will depend, maybe you, you can use your tap water if you have good quality water in your city. It is easy to check and even if you don't have a pH meter, I use pH strips because for, I don't know how, but I am, have managed to destroy three pH meters despite taking the best care of them that one can and I'm just, I, I'm, I give up. I'm not gonna spend money on that. I'm just gonna use the pH strips and I use them with, I think, quite a lot of success and I use the regular TDS meter, something that you can find on Amazon. So you can get those two things, start testing your water to know if you can use your water from the tap and by how much you need to adjust it. Maybe you just need to adjust the pH a bit, maybe the PPM is fine, or maybe it's like my tap water, which is just not really gonna cut it for plants because it has too much calcium. And then in that case, you can decide to either get an RO filter, but you all always must use a fertilizer, obviously with that, because there is no nutrients in RO water, or you can use rainwater. And perhaps this is clear to everyone, but I just wanna mention it. If you are gonna use distilled water, RO water, or the water from your dehumidifier, you will have to add nutrients almost every single time because that water really has no dissolved matters or very little, so there are no nutrients in that water, especially the distilled water. PPM will be zero to three, uh, so there is nothing in it. It's a very pure water, so you will need to add nutrients because when you take a look at rainwater, there is always something in it. It will be 30 to 50 PPM, and if there is a thunderstorm, the rainwater will be fortified with nitrogen, I think, I'm not sure about that, don't quote me ever on anything. Also, you know, whatever is washed from the trees and then you know, if your plants are growing in the soil or if the plants in the nature are growing in the soil, obviously there will be nutrients there. So it will never be without any nutrients. And with that, I think we can end this question. Oh my God, I think this is, this question is half an hour long. I hope I can add it down to five minutes. This is why, Miro, your videos are too long. You just cannot shut up about water. Okay, question number two. This is also going to be a long one, so get ready if you were not. I would love a video on Hoya verticillata. Wouldn't we all? So many different Hoyas were reclassified as Hoya verticillata, so does that mean that they are all the same plant? It is so confusing to me because my Hoya verticillata, formerly Pelida, looks nothing like my Hoya verticillata, formerly Hoya helwigiana, or Hoya verticillata, formerly Hoya acuta. The reason your Hoya pallida or acuta don't look like Hoya helvigiana is that Hoya helvigiana is not a verticillata. Hoya helvigiana, Hoya helvigi, and Hoya nicholsonii are not Hoya verticillata. Plants from Papua New Guinea and from Australia are not Hoya verticillata. Those are their own species, and I will come back to this a bit later. Hoyas from Asia or Hoya verticillata. Now, I cannot continue without mentioning Hoya pozzi, which is probably a lie, I can probably continue not mention Hoya pozzi, but if you have a plant that is under the name Hoya pozzi, it's not Hoya pozzi, Hoya pozzi is not a valid name. Again, if it's from Australia or Papua New Guinea, it will either be Nicholsonie, Helvigiana, Helvigi, if it's from Asia, it will be Hoya verticillata, just so you know. And no plant should be called Hoya Potsy. Hoya verticillata is a very, I think, difficult topic. We will not go too deep into it in this video, but I will try to make a video one day about Hoya verticillata. It will be probably what I'm sick and tired of my life, and then I will just 
make a video about Hoya Verta Salata to end it all. So I understand why you would think that Hoya Helwigiana and Helwigi and Nicole Sonye are Verta Salata. It's because even I said so in one of the videos. And the reason why I said so is I relied on Q's database. After that video, I said several times that information is not correct. Q's database in this case is not correct. In a lot of cases, it's a great resource, but in this particular case, it's incorrect. They need to update that database. I don't know when that will happen, hopefully soon. There will be more discussion about Hoya Helwigiana, Helwigi, and Nicole Sonje. And I think that Michaela Roda and Natalie Simonson are working on a book that hopefully will come out this year so we can buy more Hoya-related stuff that are not necessarily plants. Hoya verticillatas that you mentioned, so Hoya that was formerly known as Palida and Hoya that was formerly known as Acuta, those are verticillatas. You will notice that some of these Hoyas, uh, some of the Hoyas that are verticillatas, they have a different leaf shape or slightly different leaf shape. And, you know, you wouldn't really think that they're verticillata, but when they flower, you know that it is a verticillata indeed. This is why a lot of collectors, or many of them, I think, say, you no, know, don't identify based on the leaf. I don't know what plant you were sold under the name Hoya Acuta, but I know that, for example, the plant that I bought under the name Hoya Parasitica albomarginated was also sold as Hoya Acuta albomarginated. So I think there was deeper confusion there. I see that Hoya Parasitica heart-shaped is also sold as Hoya Acuta or vice versa. So all of those are supposed to be verticillatus. I will show in this video, I think, all of my verticillatus. I have Hoya species from Loi province, which is most likely a verticillata, has not yet been determined. I think I have Hoya that was sold before as Wybergiae. I have a Hoya that was sold as Parasitica with black margin, and this one has smaller leaves than the Hoya that was sold as Wybergiae or the species Loi province. I have Hoya that was sold to me as Hoya Parasitica AH006. I now call it Hoya Verticillata AH006. I think this plant comes from AH Hoya, or I call them Aha Hoya, but it's probably AH Hoya. This one has very big leaves, and on the same plant they can actually vary. They can become very big or very small, and that just depends how close or how far away it is from the light and the trellising. I have Hoya that was sold to me as Hoya Acuta EPC997, stable pink spot splash, mouthful. I today just call it Hoya Verticillata EPC997. Then I have a plant that I traded with my friend, and this one is Hoya Verticillata, supposedly with pink flower, but I'm not sure. And you can see with all of these Verticillatas, or with some of these Verticillatas at least, you can see that the leaf shape can vary quite a bit, especially when you compare something like Hoya Verticillata albomarginated with Hoya Verticillata AH006. There is quite a bit big of a difference there in size, in shape. One is more heart-shaped, the other one is more narrow. One that was recently sold all over Europe is Parasitica Black Margin. The leaves are very small and heart-shaped. They are different than the rest of the Verticillatas. Now, what makes these plants Hoya Verticillata is obviously the flower, the shape of the flower and uh, also the, sometimes the color of the flower. Now with verticillatas you have white, pure white flower, a bit of pink, a bit of cream, and I think it can be slightly greenish. With Nicholsonia, the flower will not be white, it will be either creamish or yellowish. And there are probably other characteristics in the flower that make them different. When I look at the Corona and Corolla, they look a bit different to me. And maybe even the Polinarium is different, that I do not know. But there is a difference in terms of the flower. And I don't really know if I answered that question, if there is something else. I will make a more detailed video about Hoya Salata one day. I am waiting for at least one of my Hoya Salatas to bloom. So far, it doesn't seem to me that they are early bloomers. We will see what some of the newer ones that I got will do, but so far, not very fast. I had some Salatas for over a year and they still didn't bloom. And, well, Nicholsonia wasn't a very fast bloomer for me either, but anyways, we're just not gonna go into that. My answer is getting a bit too long, so... We will continue this.
editing Miro put this in however to Salata section. When you ask me, are they all the same plant? Yes, they are all the same species, but they are different clones. And there are several varieties within Verticillata, but they are all the same species. It is all Hoya Verticillata. Next question is about another favorite topic of mine, and that is potting mixes. Honestly, I think five questions is way too much for this video. This question goes like this. It's really tempting to give bark and moss a try. I think I remember you talking about it, but I can't find it. Do you treat such mix basically like semi-hydro and do you leave some water in the bottom of the pot? First of all, I don't have many Hoyas in bark and moss anymore, and that's not because it's not a great mix. It is a great mix and I had a lot of success with it, but unfortunately I had root mealybugs, which is no fault of bark and moss. I bought a Hoya from a nursery and I didn't notice right away that it had root mealybugs and very slowly, but very efficiently, they spread across my other Hoyas and I had to reroot them, to change the mix, to do a lot of things to them. Anyways, when I was doing all of this, I did not have any moss available and there was just no chance that I would be able to import any moss in that time. It was just the spring of 2021 and I still didn't find a good way to import things, so I decided to go ahead and move my Hoyas to semi-hydro because I had that. I do have one Hoya that I recently rooted and I rooted it in ba boss moss and bark, and that is Hoya Lumbi. And I will show you this plant because, well, I, I like to walk to my Millsville cabinet. It, li it lives back there. Did it get a bit too much light? Yes. Am I going to do anything about it? No. So this is my Hoya Lambi, and yep, as you can see, this is a bit of sunburn, I would say, but the reason I'm not gonna move it away from the light is because it is growing really, really well. It put out this vine, and you probably don't see, but it's quite long. And I'm waiting for some new leaves, and I hope that those new leaves will grow well in this light. I hope that they will be already adjusted to a slightly higher light. It's not that bright. I just think this plant was in lower light before I got the cutting. Anyways, this cutting started off in perlite. It was very briefly in there before I moved it to bark and moss, and some perlite as well, because I... I don't know. Now, unlike my previous setup where I use a net pot, this does not, it's clearly not a net pot, it's just an orchid pot, and there are roots everywhere. I think I also showed this plant in my previous Hoya conundrums, and well, you can see that it grew quite a bit. You can see that the roots are growing well. It does seem to like quite a bit of moisture, but bark and moss, in my opinion, is a very good mix. It provides you with ventilation, but also with moisture. And I think it, this one is a bit more homogenous than before. I would put some moss on the bottom and then some bark and then a bit of moss. It's kind of like what Miss Orchid Girl does with her orchids. I used the same method for Hoyas and it worked great. And I do think I will grow more Hoyas like this because I like it. That's the only reason that I need. But I'm also liking some of the inorganic mixes because moss and bark will degrade over time. Inorganic mixes. So far it seems that in that aspect they might be a better solution long term, you know, so you don't have to repot your plants, but we'll see how that goes. I think it's always good to experiment and try out different mixes. Maybe you will find something that works better than your previous mix. So. If I were you, I would take cutting of one of the Hoyas that I already have, something that's maybe not as valuable for you or that grows really fast for you, and give it a go. What can you lose? One cutting? That's not such a big loss for the sake of science, for the sake of experimenting. There are other mixes that can work for Hoyas. It does not have to be bark and moss, but I was really happy with the results and with how the roots grew. It, they grew much better for me in that mix than when I was using coco peat, bark, and perlite. And I think I was just also not watering enough. It seems to me that they want something that's airy and can 
retain some moisture, but also being very airy. And moss, if you don't compact it, will be airy. It will be moist, but it will be airy. If you compact it, then it will rot. Over time, if you don't repot, I assume that your roots will rot because, first of all, it will get too acidic and the mix will start to compact. And honestly, I think there is not a long-term solution for this. I think some Hoyas can tolerate this compacting of the mix. I have seen Carnosas that grew really well in something that looks like concrete. That's how old the mix was. But there are Hoyas that are more sensitive, like Hoya ondulata, Clemenciorum, maybe this Hoya lambi, I don't know. I did not hear great things about it, though so far I will admit it's growing, going great. But there are some Hoyas that will just not tolerate that BS of mix compacting and there not being enough air. A lot of times people will tell me, well, I just grow my Hoyas in whatever, you know, in pure peat. But which ones? Are you growing Hoya undulata in pure peat or are you growing Hoya carnosa in pure peat? You know, it's, it's, it makes a difference. To answer the second part of this question, and it seems that I will never arrive there, but I will, I don't use it as semi-hydro. I will use cover pots or I used cover pots and I would leave just a bit of water at the bottom. The moss would soak that up and I wasn't watering that much. I will not thoroughly soak it. No, I will just use my pump sprayer, you know, give it a circle or two and the water will go down quickly because it's very airy. I will let that water sit and the moss will absorb it back up. Because this one does not have a cover pot, I do shower this every now and then just to get the mix moist and then I put it in the cabinet and the reason it doesn't have a cover pot is because the cover pot doesn't fit in the holder that I have for this plant. That's why I will wa water this one more thoroughly, but in the past, when I had them in bark and moss, I would just give it quick water and then move on to the next plant. I would leave some water in the pot. It would get soaked up and that was just enough water for the plant. So it was not like semi-hydro, you know, in semi-hydro, part of your pot will be submerged into water. No, it wasn't like that. I think this could potentially work well with self-watering too. I think a lot of people grow Hoyas in self-watering and it works great for them. And I did grow some of mine in self-watering, but uh, you know, it just gets a bit annoying when the roots get attached to the microfiber, in my case. I think that should be the end of this question for more reasons than one. Question numero quattro. Hi Miro, a question for you. Are root mealybugs the same as ordinary mealybugs? You'd think that one prefers dark places and the other type li likes light. Anyway, I'd be keen to know. Thanks, Joe. So, root mealybugs and what we call mealybugs, regular mealybugs. When I did research on mealybugs in the past, if I remember correctly, first of all, mealybugs is a general term for this entire family with over 200 genera. And the insects, the scale insects that attack our houseplants are from this genera called Pseudococcus. And in that genera, I believe there are over 100 and I don't know how many species. I think it was also close to 200, maybe not. Um, it was between one and 200, so that's a lot. <laughs> I don't know exactly what species, I, it seems to me there are several species that can attack your houseplants, but I always wonder, how do you know? Maybe you know something arrived on the plant from wherever you imported it. You, how do you know? Considering there are so many of them, how can you be sure? Like a lot of them look very similar. With some of them, you will have larger or shorter tails. Now, root mealybugs, that's Rhizoceus or Rhizoceus. I'm not really sure how to pronounce that. That is a different, it's a separate genera from the ones that you see above ground. So they're not the same, they're different, but they're in the same 
family. Obviously some mealybugs, some species of mealybugs are specific to one part of the world and or some of them are specific to only one type of a plant. The root mealybugs are just all over everything, everywhere. I, I don't know how I didn't have them sooner, but uh, it seems that they're very widespread. And I think that they all like similar conditions, or at least the ones that attack our houseplants. It doesn't matter if they're above or below ground level. They all seem to like warmth and this humidity and when you have something in, in soil it will always be you know warm, warm and moist humid whatever it seems that those above ground do enjoy light or they appear when there is more light right now i'm also battling the above ground mealybugs and i just want to say to whoever said mealybugs are easy to get rid of um f you several hundred times they're not. Cotton swab and alcohol. Do you know how many bottles of alcohol I went through? Good enough for AA meeting. They don't want to go away. They keep appearing, 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 and it's never ending. And I took apart all of my shelves. I wiped every surface. And then I went to a Facebook group and I read that they can live in outlets. In outlets, in electrical outlets. Someone said they found a nest of mealybugs in electrical outlet. I want, like, I want to burn everything down. That's what I want to do now. It seems that most of my Hoyas are doing still well. I think I have it under control, but I'm gonna tell you, I spent weeks cleaning everything and every Hoya and repotting what needs to be repotted, spraying, inhaling a lot of alcohol. Too much, really, for anyone's good. Anyways, that, that's not the point of this question. The point of this question, are they different? Yes, they are different. They are different genera but in the same family. I feel like wanted to say something else on the topic of mealybugs but I probably will not remember so. Oh yeah the root mealybugs notoriously difficult to get rid of. Best to cut roots and just start over the plant. I read on all different forums for all different plants horrible horrible very difficult to get rid of so if you have root mealybugs just start over the plant it's the fastest the easiest way. And the last did something touch me? No. And the last question, do you have Lacunosa and Leca? I have just transferred to Leca and hoping it would not rebel. Yes, I do. I do have three or actually two Hoya Lacunosas in Leca, but I suspect the third one is also a Lacunosa. They all had mealybugs too, so this is a great opportunity to check how they're doing. This one bloomed rec recently, I think I put photos and video with my Hoya Minuti Flora, and you can see it's doing really well. It's not very old. I think this is less than a year old or about a year old, I would say. I'm not quite sure. It has grown from a small cutting that was about this big and all of this grew. So it's doing really well. It produces leaves that are of different sizes and shapes. Some more hard shaped, some less. I think people sell this as Hoya Croniana Silver. They used to sell it as Hoya Croniana Eskimo, which I really don't understand why it was sold like that, but you know, whatever. I would just call it Hoya Croniana Silver. If it were a Croniana, which it's not, I think this is a Hoya Lacunosa. Anyways, it doesn't matter. I will just say that they do well in semi-hydro. They do well in Leca. Hoya Lacunosa is one of those Hoyas that would like more water. The next one that also had mealybugs is this that I got from Camilla. And I got this, I think, in May of this year and, or sorry, in May of 2021. I will never remember that it's 2022. It had maybe eight or 10 leaves, but you can see it branched out really well. And this one was first in cocoa peat and perlite, but I transferred it to semi-hydro and it's doing well. It didn't bloom yet, but another plant that is similar to this one bloomed, but that's a cross that Camilla made with Hoya Sunrise, I believe. This one has smaller leaves and they are darker green, very, very dark green. Um, that's a very lovely Hoya. This is Hoya Lacunosa SV403. I think it's one of the more interesting clones that I've had so far, but there are many interesting clones of Hoya Lacunosa and 
Believe me when I tell you I'm gonna get more of them. This one is Hoya. I bought this as Hoya Croniana Dark Leaves, but I can. I think this is also another clone of Hoya Lacunosa. It's just not as hard shaped as it should be, but you can see this one grew a bit slower, but also grew quite well in my opinion. So to conclude that question, yes, you can grow Hoya Lacunosa in most anything really, um, and this is true for a lot of Hoyas. Hoya Lacunosa, the only thing that you need to know is that it does like more water. It does not want to dry out really. I had it in more barky mix. It tolerated that, but it didn't love it. Okay, my camera is shaking. Would you please stop? We are working here. Get your act together. Thank you. That is all for today. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you have more questions that you would like to be answered and are Hoya related, you can leave them down below. And if they are intriguing, who knows, maybe they will end up in Hoya conundrums next month. If you liked this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. It's very, very close. Like it's just right under the screen. It's a very short trip. Really, it's not too difficult and an even shorter trip is from the thumbs up button to the subscribe button. Theoretically, it's shorter to the dislike button, but... Okay, it's time to go now and duct tape my mouth shut. I will see you very soon in the next video. Have a wonderful day and goodbye! I would like to take some time to thank my patrons. A massive shout out to my $5 patrons. One anonymous patron, Betsy Begonia, Bonnie Harris, Carrie, Cynthia Taylor, Danube Daniels, Estelle Farah, Housebound Heather, Hoyas and Whatnots, Kelso, Kristen Sherwood, Mars B, Martina, Alif Perday, Melissa Walker, Nicole Ferranti, Nicole and Caleb of Schlieve Tropicals, PJ, Rachel Collette Conroy, Robin L. Jennings, Stephanie H2O, Spinach Geek, Tanya, TJW, O, Vicky Dingler, Wojta Takac, and Zlokob Nipponi. Also, a big thank you to my $3 patrons Angelina Farnan, April Arroyo, Brana Phillips, Catherine G, Claudia L, Jerry's Garden, Lisa Helling, Lori Murphy, Morgan Kennedy, Nerdy Kathy, Nikki Ringlov, and Ruby. And a thank you to my $1 patrons Caroline, Marissa Summerfield, Lauren Monreal, Ryan Lambert, and Tang Watanasria Cool. Thank you all so much for incredible support. You are truly amazing and may Drew Barrymore save us all. Or at least save our Hoyas from the Millie Bucks. Bye!